Welcome to the Ozark Natural Science Center Wilderness Walk Series. Today we're going to be going with Bo Brown as we look for foraging plants along the Creekside Trail. Hi folks, my name is Bo Brown. Uh, I'm out here at the Ozark Natural Sciences Center and we're going to walk around and look at some edible plants. Uh, this time of year it's uh, typically not salad green type of year. It's more nuts and some of the late summer fruits. Uh, we're going to start here in this weedy kind of uh, scratched up area. A lot of the edibles that uh, that you'd find are they're disturbed ground invaders so you, you want to look in a place like this to get a lot of the European things. A lot of these European plants are brought here because of their food and medicine value uh, but then there's a lot of other disturbed uh, ground invaders that are natives so we'll we'll hit a few of those and this is a likely little spot here so First thing I'll show is right here. Uh, this is um, tall meadow thistle, Cerceum altissimum. We have everybody hears the word thistle and thinks uh, noxious weed, get it out of the pasture and everything. This one is the native. Uh, you can see on the underneath side, it's I got a white leaf. There's another similar one called bull thistle that is. Uh, it won't have that white on the underneath side. And then of course the musk thistle, which is very large and it comes on a lot earlier in the year. The edible part of this thing is the, well the whole thing is pretty much edible, but the, uh, the young stalk, when they first start coming up, if you get them about knee high or so, you can cut them at the ground, peel that tough skin off, and it's real pithy like celery. I mean, it just, it's, uh, it's crunchy and sweet, but way more nutrition than anything, anything celery has to offer. So that's one of the things you can eat, eat the leaves when they're very young and tender. Uh, you can just trim the spines off if they're spines. Some of them have more, more than others. I read a part about the, uh, the little heads here. If you've ever eaten artichoke, that is a thistle. And uh, right here at our feet, a lot of people overlook this plant and, and several of the ones that are all grouped in right here. Uh, again, a lot of this stuff is more of early spring, but if you have enough moisture, it'll pop up and pop back again in the fall. The one we're looking at here is Oxide Daisy. It's another European plant. It's one of the ubiquitous wildflowers. You'll see the, the big white daisy with the yellow centers. The, the greens on the basal rosette of these are excellent. They're kind of sweet and herb tasting. One of the best things I found recently for it is pizza topping. The, the flavor of that leaf just goes great with those little mini pizzas I make. So that's a good one. And you can harvest the leaves off of, off of it at any stage. They're still, at, even at the point the flower is on, so they're, they're good to eat at any stage. Right next to it, another very tiny plant. And this one gets much bigger again in the spring. This one is uh, peppergrass. It's in the mustard family. If you could see the flowers, it would have two or four petals in a cross shape. It's all mustards. That's a typical characteristic of mustard. It's got these little uh, seed heads that look like, uh, I always thought they looked like tractor seeds. But the tops of these things, uh, you chew on them, and it, it really is a lot like black pepper. So you get that plant, and then other plants that have a lot of oxalic acid in them, like sorrel and put the two together and it's like lemon and pepper seasoning. There's another one here that's a very small representation of what this plant is in this earlier summer. This one is broad-leaved plantain. And this is one of the plants that probably every single foraging book in, that's out there for the United States will cover this plant. It's another one uh, from Europe that was brought here because of its qualities of being an edible and a very good medicinal. The leaves, um, you can just put them in a salad when they're really young, tear them up. They got a slight bitter taste. Just think of it as arugula or something in your salad. Uh, or you can make a pot herb with it. Uh, the seeds, this little seed spike, you can rip those seeds off of there, just like that. And those are, are good nutrition, again, slightly bitter, but uh, you can toast them up and put them in your food and, and really get a lot of nutrition out of it. The whole plant is supposedly has antibiotic properties. Uh, and I've used this to you as a medicine many times. You crush the leaf up. If you've got an infection going on somewhere, and like you've, you've cut yourself and it's starting to infect when you're out in the woods, 
crush up some of that, the, the wettest leaves, you know, the damp young leaves that you can find, crush them up and make a poultice and tie it, tape it, however you can, just to get it right in contact with that wound and it will kill an infection. It's, it's kind of amazing. Here we have a plant that uh, most people have seen. It's in it all over the roadsides. It's one of the most common plants in the United States. I've seen this up on above Timberline in the Rocky Mountains, uh, just about every habitat. Uh, a lot of people know it as Queen Anne's Lace. It's, uh, its Latin name is Dalcus Corota, which is the exact species you plant when you plant a garden carrot. If your, if your carrot stays over winter, you don't pull it and it lives through the winter, it will put up a Queen Anne's Lace flower in the winter. So it's uh, uh, the typical carrot family, which they changed on it. It used to be umbel umbelifery, now it's A-B-A-C-E. But uh, that whole family is some of our most common plants that we'll eat in, you know, carrots, parsley, uh, cilantro, whole, whole uh, wide range of that kind of plants that we eat on a daily basis. Then it also has water hemlock and poison hemlock, which are the most fatally toxic plants in North America. So a lot of books advise staying away from this plant until you know exactly what you're doing because you don't want to make that mistake. The, the difference in the mature plant is that the wild carrot has a hairy stem and hairy uh, leaves and the poison hemlock is smooth and it usually have purple spots. One of the mnemonics for that is the queen has hairy legs. So I kind of like that. I want to go ahead and yank this one out of the ground since it's done what it's going to do. This is not the stage you would eat it at. This is the second year stage after it's produced the flower. So the root is mostly tough and woody. The time you want to collect these is that it's a biennial plant. It will produce a basal rosette the first year and the roots are tender when you catch it then. Then the second year when it puts the flower stalk, it's, it's not as good, but it will have a carrot smell. So that's the, the really the best way to tell those two plants apart. If the root uh, is solid and smells like a carrot, it's Queen Anne's Lace, and if it smells like dirt or kind of an acrid smell, sometimes it'll even have little open air chambers in it, that would be poison hemlock. And uh, this time of year, you'll see the little seed heads. These seeds in here are excellent seasoning. So, and they will, this thing will make a cup and those seeds will persist almost the whole winter in there. So if you're out camping, you're making some stew out of what you found out there, you need to season it up a little bit. That's a, a real nice little seasoning to, to put in there. And if we move over here, right here, this is another non-native plant. I thought it was important enough in my book, Foraging the Ozarks, that uh, people know native from non-native, so I put it right up in the header to, uh, to notify you that whether it was, it was an introduced plant or not. This one is from Asia, and it's called, uh, the Latin name is uh, Perilla frutescens, and so a lot of people just call it Perilla. It's also known as beefsteak mint. And I've heard it called horse mint, but that encompasses about three or four other mints, so I, I don't like that term as much. It has a square stem, which all mints have a square stem, but not all square stem plants are mints, though. So it, uh, but when you pick it, you'll immediately notice it has a very strong odor. This is very prominent in Asian cuisine. They, uh, they have entire dishes made around the flavoring of this. The, uh, they make infused oil with it to use for cooking. I like to get small chunks of it, like uh, you know the young tender leaves, tear them up and put them in a salad for a little bit of flavoring. You can make tea out of them. The mint oil is so strong that uh, it uh, stays on the, the stem after it's died back in the winter, so you can even make tea out of the dead stems. It is toxic to livestock, apparently. So I don't have livestock, nothing, nothing I have to worry about, but people that do really try to get this out of their, their uh, areas and stuff. I did find a use for those big leaves. The leaves will get, oh, maybe five, six inches. Uh, there's a Greek dish called dolmas. And so I got the idea to use the leaves for this to roll up seasoned meat, rice, and whatever you want to stuff in there. So it's a really good good use for that. So uh, again, it's, it's one of those, it will take over your garden if you let it. This is a plant I grew up with. 
Um, my mom always wanted us kids to go out in the spring and gather her pokeweed, curly dock, and lamb's quarters for her boiled greens. And uh, normally it's an early spring thing, but if we have enough moisture, these will pop, pop up again, little shoots. The entire plant is pretty toxic, so you do have to cook it. And there's a lot of misinformation out there about it, and a lot of people pass it by just because of the, the misinformation. Uh, you really want to boil it until the water turns. Some people even suggest uh, two boilings or even three. If you're boiling something three times, you probably lost a lot of the, the, the nutrition that's in there. Uh, mm -hmm. When it's a small plant, eight, eight inches higher, so you can take the whole shoot and cook the shoot and top leaves. Higher, taller than that, you want to get just the top tender part of the, the top few leaves and a little bit of the stem there. And if it's, I've eaten it up to chest high almost, but at that point you do want to go into the two boilings. I'll do a parboil and then a full nice long boil. But it's an excellent uh, pot herb. They call pot herb greens the ones you have to cook for whatever reason. Some there that softens them up. Some like this one, there's a toxin in there. Um, so there's a, some have spines like uh, wood nettle and stinging nettle. So there's various reasons to, to cook the ones. But that's the small plant. Here's more the mature plant. And you can see those purple berries on there. Uh, those are pretty toxic. But not just the berry. It's just the seeds within the berry. Uh, it, they, there's records of a toddler eating two or three of those berries and being fatal. So it's something, you, if you have them in your yard and you have young kids that might be attracted to it, you want to kind of remove those. But the juice is perfectly edible. You can strain those seeds out and you can make jam out of the ju uh, juice or wine. I've, I've had some excellent pokeberry wine. They don't taste so good by themselves, but uh, it's like jelly and a lot of those things. You put enough sugar in it, it's going to be pretty good. So, uh, but that's way past the stage you want to eat it. You can see they get the purple stalk. A lot of people say when the, the purple starts coming on is when you would want to uh, avoid eating it. This is one of the late summer fruits that you'll be coming across. Uh, this is one of the wild grapes. Uh, we have quite a few uh, varieties of vitus, which is the genus of that. Uh, I believe this one is riparia. Um, not exactly sure, they're, they're pretty hard to tell apart, but they all have the big the grape leaf like that. Uh, some are small and don't taste so good. Uh, and then you go from that to the uh, muscadine, which is the best grape there is in my opinion. So this is a, just an example, something you'd find in just about any habitat, up, up, uh, upland, dry habitats like this, and you'll find them along the, the creek. So uh, that's a good one to come across. You can fill your belly on that. And we talked about the oxide daisy earlier. Uh, that was a little basal rosette that didn't have a flower. So we have a late blooming flower. Most of the flowers are gone this time of year. They're an earlier summer flower, and this one's still hanging on. And here we have a rather ratty specimen of, uh, it's called mare's tail, or some people call it horse tail. Um, I thought it was uh, European invasive because it was so thick and aggressive in fields. Turns out it is not, uh, it is a native. It's uh, Caniza canadensis, I believe. But the, the leaves have, a, and I wouldn't eat these at this stage, but the leaves have a very wonderful flavor to them. So it's more of a flavoring but I will put the young young leaves in the salads. Uh, it's kind of a cross between oregano. Uh, there's several little herb kind of flavors in it. So a lot of the things I put in the book were not actual food things that you would make a whole dish out of, but flavorings and just additions for your salad or pot herb greens or whatever you're cooking. So the idea is that you just combine a lot of things. You're usually not likely to come across something you can just fill your belly on. But so if you know enough, you can get a little of this here, a little of that there, and put together a fairly decent meal out of just things you find out in your yard, garden, woods, wherever you happen to be. Yeah, here we have sassafras. And sassafras is almost synonymous with the Ozarks because every kid out in the country, usually uh, their parents had them go out and dig the roots out in February, early March to make root beer. It's the original root for root beer, and if you could pull the, the root up on it, it smells just like it. The, uh, so if you boil the roots, the, the younger, the smaller roots, you can just boil whole. 
larger ones you can take the bark off of the root and leave the woody part and just just use that but if you simmer it and cook it long enough it turns into this beautiful maroon colored uh, rich looking tea and then you sweeten it and it's basically root beer so, and you can ferment it to make it a an actual beer but we didn't uh, so it's a really handy plant to know for that but the other thing is the leaves it's the only plant I know of that's got three distinct leaf types. It has a simple leaf. It will have a mitten. And the mitten can be right or left-handed. And then it will have the double-lobed leaf like that. And us old people might know, uh, somebody said, well, that's the Casper the ghost leaf. But that was an old, <laughs> an old <laughs> reference that a lot of younger oh. people don't, don't get that one. Uh, the leaves are edible too. It's one in the family of one of the most uh, aromatic families. We'll hit another one in this family. It's the laurel family. So when you have a bay leaf that you put into your soups, it's a, it's from the bay laurel, and it's uh, it's in this family. I got into cooking some years back, uh, uh, cooking ethnic foods, and I decided I wanted to make filet gumbo. The recipe called for filet powder, and I didn't know what that was. I went to find some at the store. Nobody had it. Finally found a little jar of it that was about uh, five bucks for an ounce or something and used it in the recipe. You got home and I looked at the in ingredients as dried ground sassafras leaves and I'm looking at a whole grove of it at my front yard. So it's uh, it's that it's the thing to use for gumbo, which is a, a stew with okra, rice and meat of your choice or whatever. And this is one of the main flavorings when you're making the the New Orleans version of it or whatever. But also in the spring, you can tear those leaves up uh, the, when they're young and tender and put them in the salads. You can make tea with them. They taste very different than the root. And uh, even in the winter, the, green, the, the twigs are green, and you can make tea uh, out of the twigs with that one too because they, they still have that nice oil in there. So. This is a very young cane of uh, blackberry. Everybody probably familiar with that one. So it's just now coming up uh, out of a wood pile, which is where they like. Way past time for the berries, but the leaves are really good. And you can dry the leaves and make tea. If you buy a, a tea from Celestial Seasonings, you'll notice that they, uh, uh, a lot of them will have uh, strawberry leaf or blackberry leaf. So or even raspberry leaf. So that whole family is, is the leaves are, are tea. And then you got those wonderful berries. So it's a, it's a good plant to always know where they are. Here we have yellow wood sorrel. A lot of people look at it and think may, it might be a clover because it has trifoliate leaves like a clover. But if you'll notice, the individual leaflets are heart-shaped. So uh, this plant, the sorrels are oxalis, which means all those uh, plants in that family have oxalic acid, which makes them very tart and sour. So I, I mentioned this earlier when we talked about the uh, pepper grass. It's really good to combine with peppergrass in your salads or foods or whatever so you get a lemon pepper seasoning. When, when I was a kid, these little seeds, we would pick those and they were so sour we called them pickles. And it's, uh, it's one of those, uh, we have a violet wood sorrel that's more of a woodland plant, a real early spring. It's even more so. It's so sour. It's, it's just like biting into a lemon. And it's related to the uh, purple shamrock. If you have a house plant of purple shamrock, just pinch a leaf off of that and try it, and it is that same flavor. It's very sour, and you can throw them in your salads, so you can eat out of your house plants there. So uh, it's a good one to come across. This one is uh, Smilax. A lot of people call it catbriar or greenbriar, and you can see why. There are several versions of this thing. Some have very stiff stout thorns that will they will cut you if you fall into them another common name for this thing is blaspheme vine and if you've ever been tangled up in it you know why it's called that um, some are very spiny and uh, there's another another one of carrion flower vine that has no spines at all it's it's called that because the flowers smell like rotting flesh because it's pollinated by a flesh fly in the early spring these young tendrils this is not the time of year to get it, but I'm seeing I would eat, eat this thing right here. It's like asparagus. You go down this until it snaps off easily, and that's the part you eat. And it tastes a little bit like 
uh, asparagus to some. Uh, another edible part of it is the root. Uh, the big old um, Smilex plant will have a root sometimes as big as your head. That's not edible at that stage, but when you get to the smaller, it'll it'll spread out and have smaller ones or a smaller plant. And if the root's tender enough, you can you can uh, if you can get to it. In most of the Ozark rocky soil, it about takes a backhoe to get to them, <laughs> so they're a little uh, labor intensive if you want to dig up a root or whatever. This is one of my favorite late summer fruits. Uh, it's called persimmon, and if you've ever had one, it's uh, they're almost pure sugar. They've got a uh, very unique flavor, and it's one of those things you want to collect after the, the first frost, but they'll start ripening long before that. And if you're an Henri kid like I was, we our city cousins would come to visit. We'd find a tree that had a few ripe ones and some unripe ones, and uh, we'd eat a nice ripe sweet one and then uh, say how good it was and then offer them one of the ones that uh, wasn't ripe. It's the most god-awful thing to get in your mouth. You just about have a, get a spoon to scrape it out. It's real puckery and it's, it's kind of awful. And uh, so I got whacked a few times for doing that. The leaf, also, you can make tea out of, and uh, these are in the late stages, so I wouldn't do it, but the young, early leaves are good for that. It's in the ebony uh, family, so it's very hard wood, and uh, I wasn't aware it was popular amongst other people, but I was doing a plant walk, and a guy was a golfer, and he said, yeah, I've got a, one of my golf clubs, a big wood or whatever it is, said uh, it's uh, made out of persimmon wood. So. You know, it's a, it's a very common tree in the Ozarks, and uh, one of the things, favorite things to do with it is make fruit leather. You just uh, pulp all the flesh out of it, get the seeds out of it, just use an old colander, and uh, then smear it out real fine and, and uh, on a flat piece of wax paper and let it dry, and then it's like those fruit roll-ups. So I've got a recipe in the, in the book for this called... Uh, persimmon mousse <laughs> so it's uh, uh it makes a really good dessert you can do breads with it and all kinds of stuff so it's a good one to know we talked about the laurel family earlier when we were talking about the sassafras here's another member of that family it's one of my favorite smelling plants you usually find it along wet areas along creeks and uh but apparently it does okay up in dry areas and when it can find enough moisture it's called spice bush it's uh alternate leaves the easiest thing to tell us is grab a leaf, crush it, and smell it, and it smells like citrus mixed with some spice, or it's very exotic smelling. So in the spring, I like to take the young tender leaves and just tear them up and add them to salads, cooked dishes. Uh, you can make tea with it. Um, the twigs, even, uh, after the leaves have gone, gone away for the summer and you've got nothing but twigs in the winter, the twigs have a completely different taste and smell than the leaves. So you can make tea with the twigs throughout the winter. Then in the fall, this time of year, it will have these little red berries on it. These are where it gets its name because the outer husk, I'm gonna take one of the berries, when you squeeze them and get the little seed out of there, that outer husk, you dry that and it's similar to allspice. It's a very, very, very cinnamon-like flavor to it so you can dry that and crush it up and use it as you would allspice or cinnamon in the dish some people crunch the whole thing up the berry is edible too um, i like to just use the the husk part of it or you can squirt the seed out and hit somebody with it too if you're hungry so. this is one of the wild lettuces uh, lactuca is the genus uh, this one may be florida lettuce they they're a, a woodland species they have a white latex all the wild lettuces do when you tear the the stem like that you can see the white latex and this is probably the largest one i've ever seen it's uh looks like it's over 10 feet tall and it's still blooming up there at the top the lettuces are typically a little more bitter but all the lettuce we eat in the store started out bitter that we bred out the bitter out of it to get to iceberg lettuce, which is the most non-food thing that we have in the grocery store. There's, it's mostly water, maybe a few vitamins, and practically no nutrition. These, on the other hand, have, have tons. Anything that's got the bitter,
compound in it. Uh, a lot of times that's anthocyanins, which is a big cancer fighting drug. Um, it's responsible for the color in things like potatoes and when you get purple carrots and that kind of thing. So uh, it's a good plant to, to use as a pot herb. The cooking kind of takes the bitterness out. The sap has been used medicinally for stopping wounds and, and one thing or another. It also make tea out of it. A lot of people refer to lettuce opium, that where they take the sap and dry it out and supposedly use it like opium. Uh, research turns out that there's nothing in there that has a receptor that's similar to that, so uh, it probably won't work for that, but it does provide a, a little uh, calming and relaxing effect on it, supposedly, when you, when you make the tea out of it. So. This is one of our vacciniums. Uh, it's one of the blueberries. This one they call deerberry. That's a new to me whenever I started researching book. I always called it high bush blueberry. It will get about five, five or six feet tall. Has a very nice berry on it, uh, but it's a little bit different than the one I grew up with calling huckleberry or low bush blueberry. And it's, it's much shorter. That one they call uh, hillside blueberry now. And this, this one may be that right here they don't get very tall i don't i usually don't see them more more than knee high a little bit higher than that but uh then we have a tall one they call it tree sparkleberry or i've heard sparkleberry also and that one will get up to 25 feet tall and it's the latest uh fruiting of all the blueberries these are all early early or late late summer you know june july around in there this uh farkleberry sets fruit about this time of year and they start ripening up by September and October and they will persist on the berry a lot of times way into winter. So if you're a winter hike and you can look for that and, and have a little trail nibble sometimes because they'll dry on the berry. This is a woodland mint called uh, Dittany. Wild Dittany, I guess there's a cultivar of this that is, is different. Uh, it's Cunilla organoides. And that is referenced because it's also called false oregano. It has a very herb-like uh, flavor like oregano. But when you chew on the leaf, it finishes out kind of hot, like, a, like it's got a little hot pepper on it. It's really good for seasoning. You can make tea with it. Uh, one of the, I mentioned the perilla mint dolmas earlier. This is one of the flavorings I use in the stuffing. I use this and also some sweet mints. And it gives just a really unique wide range of flavors of some that are the sweet mint like your garden mint and this one is is very different and more a lot more savory and aromatic this is probably the largest specimen of winged sumac i've ever seen in my life uh, at home they rarely get over eight six eight feet and they're very shrubby see them along roadsides and everything. Uh, the sumacs here produce a, uh, well, there's one fragrant sumac that is different, but uh, these all have bipinnate leaf, uh, leaves, like a kind of like a walnut tree. Uh, they will create these Christmas tree-shaped clusters of deep maroon berries. And those berries are awesome for making lemonade. They, in fact, this time of year when they're just ripening up, you can touch the cluster of berries and then lick your finger and it's like you just stuck your finger on a lemon. And uh, it's really high in vitamin C uh, to make that lemonade. The other thing I just discovered about using the berries for is a, a Mediterranean spice called Za'atar. Uh, Z-A apostrophe A-T-A-R. And it is the husks of those berries uh, that they remove the, the husk from the seed. Seed has a little bitter flavor, I guess. But those husks, they will dry it enough where they can work that husk off powder it and use that mixed with coriander, cumin, and several other spices to make this uh, za'atar spice. And it's very tart and aromatic with all the other herbs. And they use it for meat rubs, uh, for uh, sprinkling it over salad soups. It's just a multi-purpose uh, spice over there. So I've recently made some of my own and uh, and it was very nice. Uh, we'll, we have fragrant sumac also. I think I saw that in another spot. It's the one that is, it's trifoliate, almost like a poison ivy leaf, but uh, its berries will be loosed clusters uh, along the stem instead of a terminal cluster of the big the Christmas tree shaped thing. 
but it, it has the same thing, the, the same oil that gives it that tart flavor. A lot of people hear sumac and automatically go to poison sumac and won't touch any of it, but poison sumac does not occur in the Ozarks. It occurs for, further north and further east of, of our whole region, so put that fear to rest. <laughs> We're out here on the observation deck and I uh, wanted to point out one of the oaks that we have out here. This one is post oak. It tends to have kind of a cross in the leaf across there with, with blunt edges like that. They, uh, they do interbreed uh, quite a bit so the leaf can, they can be all over the place but the white oak group always have rounded edges and that would be uh, uh, post oak, white oak, uh, I think chinkapin's in that group. Then there's the red oak group that always had little points on it. That would be black oak, northern red oak, black jack oak, and there's quite a few more of those. Wherever they occurred in the world, oak acorns were usually the most commonly used plant source for, the, for the, whoever lived there. It's one of the few things that has a good amount of fat and good protein and if you're living a subsistence life living off the land fat is one of the hardest things you can get so uh having a plant source that has a lot of it is very good uh otherwise your your animal sources of it would be subcutaneous fat all the organ meats the brain bone marrow and you have to utilize every bit of that resource from the animals to get enough fat to, to survive and here in the ozarks we're blessed to have a Wealth. In fact, it's classified as a uh, oak hickory forest, and the hickories also have a, a lot of nuts uh, that have a, a good good amount of fat and protein and all that kind of stuff. We may uh, encounter a hickory here in a minute and talk about that. The, we don't see any acorns on this one yet, but everybody knows what an acorn looks like probably. So, uh, it, it, but it is a process of leaching the tannins out. It's not just the bitter taste. There's also anti nutrients in there that. that uh, interfere with your body's ability to, to absorb nutrients so you do have to leach that out and there's several ways uh, native uh, natives would make uh, mesh baskets or just fine fine woven baskets and break up the, the nut part of the acorn the center part underneath the hull and break that up into a mush or a powder and then uh, throw it in the creek and let the water the running water take it out and it usually takes three to five days the latest method I've heard about I haven't tried is using the tail at the bottom end of a woman's nylon stocking putting that acorn mush in that and throwing it in the tank of your toilet the repeated flushing and water coming up and down over five or six days is supposed to to uh, take the tannins out like i said that's one i haven't yet tried but the water tank is safe, safe to drink it's not connected with the bowl and that we know that's gross so <laughs> mentioned uh, hickory trees as being a source of nuts. Uh, we have one right here. They have bipinnate leaves like a walnut and this whole thing is the leaf. It comes off the stem at a node. So this is a leaf. These are leaflets and they're called odd pinnate because they have opposite, 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 then a terminal. So they're always an odd number. Uh, this particular one is the least edible of all if you can get in close enough to see here. It's got these little yellow, kind of mustard yellow buds that says that it's a bitternut hickory. And as the name implies, it's the one that's uh, probably the least palatable. They are edible, and you can still, you know, do things with the nut meats to make them taste a little bit better. But the, the best one probably is shagbark. Uh, mocker nut is not bad. There's several other species that go from... Uh, uh, good to to real good so it's a it's a good one to know it's just they're kind of a pain to pick the nut meats out Native Americans would just take the whole nut shell everything pound it to a pulp put it in a, uh, a pot and boil it and then strain it out and drink the nut milk so that's the easiest way to, to do uh, to process a lot of the, the hickories that have nut meats that are hard to extract all right, we're going to wind up the day here with uh, something that Yule Gibbons, the famous old forager guy that had the uh, 
had some of the earlier books and was kind of famous for making a really bad uh, grape nuts commercial. He called this Nature Supermarket because it has five different edible types of uh, food on it and at least one of them is available at just about any time of the year. Uh, I've seen pictures of somebody had this and they called it the corn dog plant and they had a big swipe of mustard on it. It is, it is not a corn dog. Uh, these are the actual flowers that has a male flower that occurs on the top part that produces pollen. These are female flowers and when they're ready to, this is still a little bit hard, but when they're ready to dry out, this little fluffy stuff flies all over the place and spreads the seeds. Now if you catch that early enough, this is one of the food sizes, the food types on here. If it's solid and green and very, very small at that stage, you can cook that as a vegetable. The stem can be peeled and eaten as a vegetable. It's got kind of a pithy center in there. Again, this is this is way too late in the year to be able to eat that, that food. But that pithy center is good. In the early spring, and I want to I'm going to rip out one of these to show you what it looks like. If you separate and get down into the center part of it, and again, this one's way, way too far gone to be able to eat it. But that center core, whenever it's young and just coming up in summer or in the or in the spring, is just crunchy and sweet. They call it Cossack asparagus. So that's one of the one of the uh, food types. The root, it's it's got uh, big roots that uh, what do they call them rhizomes that go all over the place. Those are a really good source of starch. You have to, it's a lot of processing. You have to pound, pound the root to, to get the starch out of it and let it settle. And there's, uh, oh, there's little uh, bags to put it in to be able to do that, to, to settle out the dust, to, u to use that as flour. There's another thing you can do if you, if you gather the pollen that comes on these male flowers, gather that up whenever that's going, then later in the year when you can get the roots and they're, they're good stage to collect, then you process the roots to make the flour. You can add that pollen to the flour and make these wonderful little cattail cakes that are just they're just awesome. They're super nutritious and uh, so it's a it's a good plant to always come across. Like I said, you, you, you can probably get the roots this time of year, but uh, it, uh, it's it is nature supermarket like Eagle says. So uh, good to know.